The following program contains strong sexual content. Viewer discretion is advised. All new Dr. Phil, the mastermind behind the Manti Teo girlfriend hoax. I came here to own up to what I've done. The real reason he fooled the football star for almost four years. The question that everyone would want to know is why? The exclusive interview. Truth is I hurt every day. The startling revelations. That's not sexual experience. That's a crime. What did his parents know? I couldn't believe my son was capable of doing something like that. Smacked us right in the face. You had to know there was a reason he was doing all of this. And the truth behind the voicemails. I love you. I don't care. So when you left that voicemail, that's you. That's me. Is he really the voice? You're going to go behind the screen and recreate these voicemails. Today, in a Dr. Phil exclusive, the man behind the Manti Teo girlfriend hoax comes clean. Yesterday, I introduced you to Renaya Tuya Sosopo, the man behind the Manti Teo love hoax. In an interview at my home, he revealed how he created Lene, the Polynesian beauty, as an intricate deception to lure the Notre Dame football hero into a relationship. Now, despite never meeting in person, Manti and the fictitious Lene's relationship grew deep and intimate on many levels. Were you in love with him? As twisted and as confusing as it may be, um, yeah. Are you gay? Honestly, I'm so confused. But what you know is that you did have romantic feelings for another man. Yes. I grilled him about why he chose Manti, how they met, and all the characters he created to perpetrate his web of lies and deceit. Why did you need a sister? After we discussed and I had pretty much killed off Lene, I checked in with Manti as Lene's brother and just trying to see if everything was OK. And then I created Ulani to try to um, reach out to him. It was Lene, Koa, Ulani. There were those characters. Did you ever, like, wake up and forget to use Lene's voice? I'm not trying to be funny, but that's kind of a rookie mistake. When you have been able to mastermind all of this and create this whole reality, that's a mistake that, you know, I never made that mistake. But during my time with him, there were many things that Renaya told me that just didn't add up. The biggest one being the voice. I just want to say I love you and good night. How was he able to spend countless hours on the phone as a woman without Manti knowing he was really a man. As the story intensified, press reports began to emerge that it wasn't really Renai on the phone. It was a woman, possibly a female family member, a co-conspirator who may have been in on it with Renai. But was it? I had to confront him on that because, as I said, I approached everything he told me with a healthy degree of skepticism. Listen, I'm not trying to get you to say something that isn't true. In fact, I'm trying to get you to say what is true. I can't, even if I tried. There's a whole lot that went into pushing me to do something like that, to go to that extreme. I just want the truth. If that is you on those voicemails, then prove it. After a lengthy discussion, Renaya finally agreed to do the voice for us. He also agreed to let us record it. The only people in the room were me and my colleague, Dr. Sophie, who had spent countless hours counseling Renaya, as well as his family, and also a camera operator. Turn it light off, sir. <clears throat> I heard him do the voice. Dr. Sophie heard him do the voice. And you're going to hear him do the voice later. I suspect you may be really surprised. But first, it's the question everyone wants answered. Why? Why would someone create and perpetrate such an elaborate and deceptive hoax? Today, you'll hear what Renaya says is the reason. I guess the first question that everyone would want to know is, um, why? It was just an escape from a lot of the things that I've been through, and I was too embarrassed to share, especially uh, coming from a family where we're well known in the football world and then you know my dad being a pastor they raised me the best they could but there were just some things that had happened um, back then that i felt then they were just too horrific and too horrifying for me to share and growing up with and holding that in as a child it just led me to wanting to escape 
my my real life and so it's my understanding that uh, you're here with dr sophie's full endorsement that this is a good idea for you to do yeah. and that he supports you doing this yeah and that he has your full and expressed permission to speak candidly about anything and everything that you two have shared uh, in your private sessions that you give him f f rights to full disclosure within his own judgment, correct? Correct. You shared something with me off camera earlier today. You've been hiding a painful secret for years, and it's one that you just started to discuss with Dr. Sophie. You were molested a number of times mm. across a number of years. I'm very sorry for that, by the way. How old were you the first time that you were touched inappropriately? I was 12. OK. And this was by someone close to you. It was not an immediate family member, but it was someone close to you. Close to my family. Right, close to your family. Yeah. And this was an older, yeah. older person, right? Did you know what was happening when it happened the first time? The first time it happened, I, I had no idea. All I knew at that time in my life was basketball, basketball, more basketball. I, I didn't know anything else. I was pretty popular at school. I didn't know anything other than what a 12-year-old would know. So it started off with a hand and, and touching and stuff like that. And at this time, I hadn't had any sexual experience ever. I didn't even have the chance to have my seventh grade health class, you know, where they explain this type of stuff of how babies are made. I didn't have that talk yet with my parents. And so, no, I didn't know what was going on. What we're talking about here at 12 years age was the first time that he was touched inappropriately, clearly confused, didn't right. know how to react or what to say to himself about this. What was the impact on him at that point? This is a clean slate, a child with no experiences. So that then therefore breaks that whole foundation. He's loved for the first time. He feels confused. He's violated physically, emotionally. He doesn't know where to go. He's in a panic. And we know that there was a pattern here that this continued right. across time. Right. And so this begins to really define him in, in a very ugly way that changes his self-worth, changes Absolutely. his self-esteem. Dark and dirty is how he felt. Okay. Well, let's continue the interview. There was an extra pressure here, though. You had not enjoyed a close relationship with your father for a number of years because he traveled a lot and was gone, correct? Correct. You had been raised essentially by who? Uh, my grandparents, uh, my mom, and then mainly my mom's sisters. But then your father had kind of found his way back to the family and, yeah. and to the church. Correct. And had gotten very involved, right? Correct. And this had kind of happened uh, essentially on his watch. Correct. What was your fear if you had, had, had brought this up? What were you afraid of? Immediately, I was afraid that if I would, you know, go and say, hey, dad, or hey, mom, this happened to me with so-and-so, my dad would be angry, what father wouldn't. And then from there, I felt, if I tell him that, who knows, maybe that'll make him hate church. I couldn't just be like, you know, dad, this happened to me, and I didn't know what to expect, what the reaction I would get, but I knew that I could not go <clears throat> forward with that. So you thought, A, I'm ashamed of this. B, I don't want to be the cause of driving my dad out. Yeah. So keep my mouth shut and hope this doesn't happen again. And just hold it in and hope it doesn't happen, but it, it did happen. It didn't again. happen one more time, not two more times, not three more times, four more times. It just kept happening, it, right? Yeah, yeah. And it went from touching to what? From touching to every form of molestation and abuse you could think of. I mean, I don't know how to say it without saying it in a way where... You were raped. Yeah, correct. More um, than once. More than once. Brutally, painfully raped. Correct. To the point that you physically couldn't walk. Correct. And you never did tell anybody about that? Not even my closest cousins, not even my sisters, not even my mom, my dad. I didn't tell anyone. I held it in and kind of just took it and moved on and hoped that the feeling of <clears throat> disgust and the feeling of 
filth and the feeling of just every feeling that came along with it. I just hope that it will go away, but it, it didn't. It didn't. I want to talk about why you felt moved to create an alter ego, why you felt the need to represent yourself as somebody other than Ronaya. That's coming up. Plus, Ronaya's parents react. It just smacked us you know, right in the face. I couldn't believe that my son was capable of doing something like that. And later... You have been deceptive. You've lied. You've manipulated. You've perpetrated a fraud. Growing up, Renaya says his relationship with his father, Titus, was almost non-existent. Titus, a football star and later a musician, was frequently on the road battling his own demons. After years away from his family, Titus finally returned home, giving Renaya the father he had always longed for. Titus also returned to their church where he became a pastor and began ministering to troubled youth. It was during this time when Renaya was just 12 years old that he says he began being brutally sexually assaulted by some of these young men. Renaya says he kept the painful secret hidden for fear of driving his father away from him yet again. But that still doesn't explain why years later he felt the need to hide behind another persona. I want to talk about why you felt moved to create an alter ego, why you felt the need to represent yourself as somebody other than Renaya. I felt that I couldn't do things, accomplish things, pursue things, live out as Renaya, and I felt the need to create this. It has everything to do with what I went through as a child and my experience. Um, with child molestation and, and abuse. When you tie that in, all that abuse in on top of the pressures of coming from a family who not only is well known in the football world, but also the pastor's family, I felt with all these pressures, um, I was so dirty and, and filthy. And for me to come out and say, <clears throat> this happened to me, at that time, I didn't have that strength. I, I understood that through all of this, my dad wanted the best for me. But a lot of the time, what he wanted and what I wanted were so different. And we battled through that. And to have this in the back of my mind and to have that all at once, it was just um, an incredible pressure that I really can't explain. But that same pressure it was kind of the key ingredient in me creating Lene and me um, having that as my escape. So what you're telling me is you felt too damaged to have the confidence to present yourself as Renaya. Correct. But if you could escape that reality yeah. and become Lene, yeah. then clean slate, reset buttons hit. Exactly. I can be fresh, I can be new. Exactly. And it wasn't just creating Lene, because a lot of people were like, well, then how come you didn't create a guy? Well, the truth was, um, when I was being violated, it wasn't happening as a little boy. I was being touched on, grabbed on, abused as if I were a girl. The way my body was grabbed, the way I was touched, the way I was spoken to, I thought that, you know, like I was too damaged, and that was that. So, Dr. Sophie, this was an escape mechanism. I mean, this was never intended to exploit anyone. This, this started out as a way to escape this reality, this pain, and for a period of time to be someone new, someone fresh, someone different. Yes, to a point, but I also, as you can see, he's a very articulate young man, he's very intelligent, and I think he also knew there was probably something left inside of him that was good, and he was testing it out. And I think a mask would help him see that he is lovable, capable of being loved, capable of feeling love, without ever having anyone see him yet. Was it validating to you, to you, Renaya, knowing the interactions of Lene with whoever, Manti or who, whoever, that whatever reactions you got, whatever connections you, you had, were coming from you, were coming from Renaya? Yeah. 
yeah, it was validating for him to see, I think, that he could be loved and could love. One of the most validating things was, like, I would sit back and watch how the impact that Lene had on Manti, and, and I would watch through his eyes the good that he saw in Lene. She was just that person that I turned to. And even though she was fighting leukemia and, you know, fighting various things, she always found time to serve someone else. And her biggest thing to me was always be, always be humble, always be humble. It was, you know, her character, her heart, um, humility. Uh, she always told me to keep God first. Um, a lot of the things that, you know, he was sharing with people and a lot of the insights that he was sharing about Lene had nothing to do with physical attraction. When I looked at Lene through Manti's eyes, I got a glimpse of who I was as far as my heart. I never sat there and tried to um, use him in any other way than to help him to, to be a better person. But that became another person for you. Lene became another person for you. Correct. Renaya's parents accompanied him to my home and were on the sidelines listening to the interview. I wanted to know how they felt when they found out that their son was the mastermind behind one of the biggest sports hoax scandals in years. So I invited them to join in the conversation. They had no idea that you were Lene Kakua in a relationship with Manti Teo. My parents? Right. Oh, until then, no one had. Like, some people, random people, had suspected that I had involvement, but no one knew that, you know, that I, I was. No one. When it comes to light that your son is embroiled in what has become a national controversy, a national scandal, and you find out that he is the she that is at the other end of this online relationship with a false identity, with the runner-up to the Heisman. As a father, as a parent, how do you wrap your head around this? When we, when we first found out, as I'm listening, it just felt like drinking from a fire hydrant. It kind of just smacked us uh, you know, right in the face. Did you have any idea before no. Renaya told you? Absolutely. You just came totally out of the blue. It's like he just... Yeah. The first words you heard was from him. He sat us down before he even got to the Manti part of the, the story, listening to the, the abuse that he received. It helped put things in perspective. It took a while to sink in. I didn't really have a response immediately. Uh, my first response is, I love you, son. After hearing all of that, nothing changes my love for him. Nothing changes that the fact that he's still my boy. What did you think? When I came to me first and I didn't understand what he was trying to tell me, something looked very heavy on his heart. So then he just broke down and he shared a little bit. A few conversations later, the man Teo topic came up and I was upset because I was thinking of his family, his parents. I couldn't believe that <laughs> my son was capable of doing something like that. Do you forgive him his mistakes? Coming up. Not just mincing words with you here. That's not sexual experience, that's rape. That's a crime. And later. It's different when it's done in the dark and then when you're completely truthful about it and you come out, it's painful. We now return to Dr. Phil's interview with the man behind the Manti Teo girlfriend hoax. Do you forgive him his mistakes? Yes. In this situation? Do you think less of him? No. Absolutely not. Did you get the, the complexity of this? He had a relationship at every level. They became friends. They became lovers of sorts. They had intimate exchanges, sharing the most intimate 
aspects of life about faith and goals and it was it was at every level you also know that it got down to the point where this was a a whole life this wasn't just somebody's picture and sent a few emails this was a relationship this was complex i mean young people any people but certainly young people don't do anything if there isn't a reason there isn't a payoff you, you had to know there was a reason he was doing all of this and and that's why you understood the importance of what had happened to him earlier yes. you've been listening to everything that we've been talking about so far hard for any parents to hear that their son has been victimized in such a terrible way um, tell me what it was like to hear hear him talk about that uh, it was tough because of um, uh, the upbringing of, uh, of our son uh, when I was born I was a sophomore in college and I was still busy with football I would say the first five years I was rarely around I was playing ball and traveling and so I didn't uh, develop uh, that typical father-son healthy relationship I was very dependent upon my wife's grandmother, just my family, just kind of <clears throat> be there for him. Listening to the ramifications, it was, it was difficult to hear, but so necessary. Were you disappointed that he didn't come to you the first time someone touched him inappropriately? Yes. As he was explaining it to me, I, I, all of the incidents, I, right away, uh, when he uh, told me the location, the time, where it was, I, I could go back and, and vividly remember, uh, you know, those trips, the times that uh, these guys came over. And that part right there was kind of uh, gut-wrenching for me. And uh, How far was, away were you when this was happening? Uh, were you near, in the house, yes. small house? Yes. We had a, 30 feet away, a room away? A room away. That has to be overwhelming to realize because he's 12 and he's alone and he's confused and he doesn't feel like he can come to you because he's afraid that he'll upset the apple cart and that you'll go away. That has to tell you how much he loves and values you being there. Yeah. His being there meant more to you than the pain and fear you were suffering, right? You thought, I'll pay this price to keep him there. Yeah. Yeah. And he paid that price for a long time. Yes. Does that affect the way you, you feel about the choices he's made? It gives me a, an understanding about the choices he's made. I, 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 uh, wrong, right, it, it gives me a, a, an understanding of why he did what he did. He says that he believes he's gay. He says, I don't know, I'm confused. He says that's the only sexual experience that he had had. And I, I'm, I'm not just mincing words with you here. That's not sexual experience, that's rape. That's a crime. If, in fact, he's gay, you love him just the same. He is still my son. He's still our son. And we love him unconditionally. Coming up. People say, what well, does he even have any feeling towards this? The truth is I hurt every day. For the decisions I made, I can't express how sorry I am. And later, is he really the voice? I love you. You're going to go behind the screen and recreate these voicemails. We now return to Dr. Phil's interview with the man behind the Manti Teo girlfriend hoax. I mean, you've been very clear. You have been deceptive. You've lied. You've manipulated. You've perpetrated a fraud across an extended period of time and victimized someone that 
was just kind of sitting out there minding their own business because you were seeking to exercise some demons. I mean, to try to get away from a past. What do you take away from this that's positive? This whole experience has been, it's been a lot. Overwhelming isn't the word. One of the things I know for a fact, the positive things I walk away from this, it's not just for me, but for my family. I can't express how sorry I am towards Manti and his family and everyone affected by this. I can't express how sorry I am to my family and just the ones who've been there for me, no matter what, and everyone who carries my last name or has been affected by the media, I can't express how sorry I am to all of them. People say, well, does he even have any feeling towards this? The truth is I hurt every day for the decisions I made. This has been, I can't even say that difficult or trying. None of those words describe how hard this has been. I'm sure for Manti's family, for the Notre Dame program, but also for my family. And that's why I come here not trying to refute his story. I came here um, to own up to what my involvement and what I've done. And I'm not seeking everyone's forgiveness because the truth is, Dr. Phil, it doesn't matter how many goods I do or, or bad things I do or we do, not everyone will forgive you or like you. And so I can't make everyone happy and I'm not trying to, but I came here and I, I, I stand with courage to say, I'm very sorry for the horrible things that I'm well aware. Sincere? It's as sincere as it can be today with the opening and the cracking of all of this bleeding out. But every day, we'll see where it goes because I want to see, is he going to own what it's going to take to really step up and be the person he needs to be, clean himself off, and move forward? It's easy to be remorseful in the spotlight, but at the end of the day, are you going to be honest with yourself and remorseful with yourself and really do that hard work? Can this young man turn this around I mean, is this a defining event in his life, or can he overcome this and, and get some traction in this world? It's up to him. Does he want to be owned by himself? Does he want to connect his head with his heart, walk forward, and do the things that he preaches about his church and about his family and the things that are important to him and be himself? Or does he want to continue to use this as a way to manipulate through the systems? Coming up. These are voicemails. Are these you? The truth behind the voicemails. Uh, I want you to do the voice for me. I don't feel comfortable doing this on TV. Okay. If you're covering for someone else, I just want the truth. If that is you on those voicemails, then prove it. We now return to Dr. Phil's interview with the man behind the Manti Tail Brand I and told him that you're sorry for what you put him through and that you forgive them for being less than perfect because they weren't there to protect you at the time that these things happened to you. I mean, have you said that to them? Yeah. When I came clean with them, I looked my dad straight in the face and I told him, you know, I'm sorry. I, this just got out of my control, but I, I let him know that, you know, and he asked for my forgiveness, handling it as a youth pastor at the time, not being more careful. Because with 12-year-old logic, he went through a lot to keep you in his life. Yes. Wasn't rational, but to him it was. And that's how important it was to him for you to be there. Yeah. He said, I will let you do these things to me if it means I keep my dad in my life. And um, that's tough. that says a lot, though about what you mean to him. He admires the two of you greatly. You came full circle and you were honest about that. From this, I walk away knowing who my true family and friends are. And one of the biggest things I can say I walk away from this is I pray and I hope that for any other children who are out there, if something like this happens to you, and I know it happens to so many young people. Just know that you're not alone. Don't be afraid to reach out because you know, your family, they're there for you. 
and as shameful, as dirty as you feel, you feel so guilty for things, you're a child. And the thing is, if you don't reach out for help, for me in this situation,